Um, so good morning. My name is, is Diego. I am one of the co-founders of uh, Conan Packers Mayer. And today I wanted to do this talk because uh, this is the current state uh, by the ISO C++ survey. And in the, the pains, the survey is, is asking about the pains for developers. And the four top pains are managing libraries, build times, setting CI, and managing CMake. Those are the four topmost pains in the survey. And at the same, at the same time, uh, how do you manage your libraries? And then the answer is, I just put the source code in inside my repo, or I build manually following the readme from the, from the GitHub repo. Okay, so there is like a, something that is off there, something that is really not, not working. So I wanted to, to do this presentation today, trying to understand why, what the, the current state, what was the, the situation in the past, and how, especially how we are looking forward for the, for the future of this, of this problem. So let me start, I'm going to start with the present, today. What is possible today? And I'm going to start, I always uh, like to do demos. So I'm going to do a live demo of what is possible today with dependency management. And I'm going to build a small application here. I have the source code. This is an application that is using uh, TensorFlow for artificial intelligence. It's very trendy, so I'm going to use it. It's, it's super cool. And I'm going to use OpenCV. Okay, so I need these two dependencies in my application, these two libraries, and of course the transitive dependencies. This is very important. This is the CMake list that I'm going to use to build my application. Okay, can you see something there that is specific to Conan or any other package manager? There is nothing. This is pure, pure standard CMake. Okay, so whatever we are going to do now, this image list is completely unaware of the dependency management uh, for it. Uh, and finally, in some place, we need to specify the dependencies that we want. In this case, for this application, I need TensorFlow and I need OpenCV. In this case, I'm, running, I'm writing a, a Conan file.py that contains these two dependencies with the versions that I want to use. And then, for a developer, when a developer, they get this, they, of course, they have to have Conan installed in their machine, but Let's check that I don't have any Conan dependencies installed so far. Everything that a developer needs to do now is clone the repo, then they will be doing CMake, preset, default, and then this will launch CMake, and then CMake will start installing the dependencies. We see that it's installing not only the two dependencies, but all the transitive dependencies that OpenCV and TensorFlow need. It will install all of them, it will install pre-compiled binaries. Okay, we can see that it was installing FMPK and, and others that are, uh, it took a little bit more to unzip them. And now I can just build my application. I could open my IDE, but I'm building from the command line. I can just build my application and hopefully execute it. And if everything is working, this is a post detection animation. I, I can dance as you did yesterday night, and it will be working. So, uh, this is the current state. Okay, I think it's good. I think it's really good. We achieved a fully transparent integration. It was commanded by CMake. I didn't have to type any Conan commands at all. And the cool thing is that it works exactly the same in all platforms Windows, Linux, Mac, cross building. You can do it in every platform. And note that we were not only installing OpenCV and TensorFlow. We were installing all of those dependencies, okay, because those are the transitive dependencies of those two libraries. Okay. If you try to do this by hand, in your, this is a Windows machine, by the way. In Windows, it can take days to set up something like this. Okay. So I think the situation is good. Uh, how have we managed to get there? First, thanks to a great community. So now in Conan Center, we got the experience and we have more than 1,500 recipes for different packages that the community contributed. And they form, they create more than 500,000 binaries for different configurations. And those recipes for those packages are downloaded more than 250,000 times per day nowadays. 
These recipes, they were contributed by our amazing community. Last year alone, we got more than 5,000 pull requests okay, for Conan Center for these, for these recipes. And also, we got a ton of feedback from private users. In this case, Conan and C++ is very, very enterprise. So there are tons of enterprises using Conan privately, actually way more than people using Conan Center. And they are also driving a lot of feedback and asking, hey, how do they want us to evolve Conan and CMake integration together for their needs? So let's see now, let's go back to the past and let's see how we started. We started with uh, this. This was 2015. And this is our first public release, and this was our only integration with CMake. It was called the CMake Generator. And the CMake Generator, when you type the Conan install command, it was creating one single file that was called conanbilinfo.cmake. That file, you had to include it explicitly in your CMake list, like this, include something conanbilinfo.cmake. Then you had to call a Conan basic setup macro and finally, you had to define a Conan libs in your targeting libraries for your own applications. Okay, explicitly, Conan libs, this is as is. Note that this was also back compatible with CMake 2.8. Uh, okay, we were talking about uh, 20, 2015. Uh, internally, the Conan basic setup was doing something like this. It was a macro with two different parts. The first part, the Conan global flags, was intended to manage dependencies information. And then it, you had all the, all the information from your dependencies, like setlib and other, other dependencies, the include paths, library paths, library names, et cetera. You have them in variables. And then the macro Conan global flags was defining globally, globally with include directories and link directories, it, it was defining those variables. Okay? The other part of the Conan basic setup was focused on the tool chain. In this case, on the compiler, things like that. In, for example, setting up the C++ standard for our, for our application. And again, it was getting the information from, from there and activating something like CMake CXX standard. This is a bit simplified, because back in 2015, this was not a standard. So you had to set the C, CMake CXX flags manually for these things. But more or less, you, you get the idea. Where the information from the uh, Conan Billing for CMake gets from? Uh, from two different sources. The first source was the, is the profile. The profile is a text file that defines our inputs. In this case, that we are using the GCC compiler, this version, this standard library, this uh, C++ standard, and so on. And this profile is mapped to the Conan Billing for CMake variables that are later activated by the Conan Basic uh, uh, setup macro. The other part of the information comes from the packages, from the recipes of the packages that we are using in our application. Uh, this is more or less how a recipe of, uh, for the setlib uh, library looks like. It will contain different, different methods, like the build method, the package method. It describes how this uh, package is built from source to create, to create the binary. But the most important thing that I wanted to, to uh, focus today is the package info method. Because this, this method here is the one that contains the information for the consumers. Okay, is the one defining A for this package, the headers are in the include folder, libraries are in the lib folder. The library name itself uh, can change. If you compile setlib yourself, you will realize that in Windows it's called setlib or cdll or in Linux it's called just set. So the, the library name is, is changing based on the, on the system. The recipe is the one responsible for defining that. It's not the consumer that they need to figure, okay, I'm linking C uh, setlib, and then the name will be, no, no, it's the recipe itself of setlib defines for their consumers their information. What is the, the things that they, they, they contain? Um, and this information is what is mapped, is translated to the Conan Bill Info CMake. Uh, in the form of variables that then are later uh, activated as include directories or, or library directories. And you might be asking, hey, why are you using just global variables? Why are, aren't you using the CMake files? First, because we are talking about 2015. Okay? At the time, many libraries, they didn't have fine modules. They didn't generate config uh, files at all. And some of them that they did, they did them very poorly. 
I'm talking especially about transitive dependencies. You, could we, for example, using a, a, a fine model or something of a library, um, and then it will be finding OpenSSL. It will be finding OpenSSL in the system. So if you have some package that depends on OpenSSL, open it will not get OpenSSL from your package. It will get the old version of OpenSSL in the system, for example. And that, as you can imagine, that, that's, that's very bad. And also now we are a bit more used to modern CMake with targets and stuff. The modern CMake was popularized, we are talking in 2017 and 2018. Okay? And this first integration was in 2015. So it took a while for, for the modern CMake and targets to, to, be, to be mainstream. But there is a, one special reason that we really wanted to have the package info method in our recipes uh, to work. And the reason is interoperability. There was one design criteria in Conan from the very beginning, and it's still today, that every package created with any build system should be usable by any other package in any other build system. And I know that you are probably mostly into CMake and you don't care only about CMake, but there are still many, many critical packages out there with other build systems. And there are also other build systems, like Meson, for example, that they are pushing hard, or XMake, whatever. They are good competitors, they are good build systems, okay, that there should be, they should have a chance also to compete and have a space. The only way that we can have a, like a fair uh, game for, for everyone is actually if we care about interoperability between build systems. Okay. The way we achieve that with the Conan file and package info is, okay, any package in, in Conan Center, any of the 1,500 uh, Conan packages, can be used by any build system. Okay, so those were our principles. That was our starting. And from there, we started to evolve together with CMake. And then as, as CMake targets started to be more mainstream, then our first natural step was, okay, let's do not use global variables in CMake. Let's use targets. And then our Conan basic uh, setup and Conan building for CMake was generating targets. You, we could opt in. Hey, we want the targets, so we could pass the targets parameter there. And then instead of getting global variables, we would be creating targets. Like, still, we will be creating like, our own artificial targets. Many of the libraries out there, they didn't define their own targets names yet. So we just invented uh, some new, new targets names. And then we started to get the push from the community. And we, Conan was getting traction and more and more traction. And then we started to get the feedback. Hey, OK, this is looking great. But we would like to have our CMake list as less modified as possible. We don't want to introduce Conan specific things. That's a totally legit claim. Okay, and this was the, the, the reason that we created the first, the first almost transparent integration that was called CMake Find Package. The, fin the CMake Find Package was created in still module files, not config files, module files. Because back then, we are talking now in 2018, uh, module files were still like the, probably the, the most common use. And most projects were creating modules for the dependencies. So many projects, they were not creating the config files yet. And then it was on the consumers to create the modules to use the dependencies. So we created the CMake Find Package that was creating a module file for every dependency that you had in your dependency graph. And then with this approach, we could do the define package, and it would be finding the Conan package uh, library. And still, we had the two approaches. We still allowed the global variables. And as targets were already, were already there, we also enabled targets in the, as a result of find package. And then we could start like, linking something that it was closer to uh, like the fully transparent thing, which was setlib, colon, colon, setlib. So this has started to look, to look very nice. Then the next step of the feedback, okay, yes, this is almost what we wanted. But it happens that the, what we call the upstream, like the official sim, uh, setlib project, uh, it creates targets or the official CMake module in, that is bundled with CMake, when you install CMake, is calling setlib not with lowercase. It's calling, it's calling setlib with uppercase. So you are almost there, but you are still creating for me targets and names and file names with setlib lowercase. And that means that I cannot f have a fully transparent integration because my previous, my previous CMake list, I'm using setlib with uppercase. So then we, what we did is, OK, it's no problem. We have a method in recipes 
that is dedicated to define the information for the consumers. We have the package info method. And where we are defining everything, the include directories, the library names, let's define here what is the name of the targets that CMA should be creating, or the name of the files. And in this case, we added a section there, it's called the names, and we could uh, then define, okay, this is going to be uppercase. Note that not all packages, not just lowercase and uppercase. And uppercase. There are some libraries and packages out there that their project is, co is called uh, foo, and the target is called bar. It's calling something absolutely different. Okay, so it's not just a Boolean for uppercase, lowercase, it's a full string. You can put the name that you want there. And with this change in, in our package info method, then we managed to get like an almost transparent integration again, with the right casing, with the right names, and then the file setlib module was okay. The find package set with setlib in uppercase was fine in the R module, and the target was called setlib colon colon setlib in uppercase, and this is what, what the users wanted. Okay, next iteration. Config files start to get more popular, and, and projects start to create their own config files, and okay, we, and CMake also said, hey, Config files are much preferred. They realized that modules uh, didn't scale at all. Okay, and the only way to have something that, that, that really scaled is having each project generate their own config files. Okay, so then the trend starts to move towards config files. Say, okay, let's have a generator that instead of creating module files, CMake module files, it will create CMake config files. And this was called the CMake find package multi generator. Instead of creating the module, we were using the same rules. We, we already had the information about the uppercase name or whatever, so we could reuse that. And then we could create the, um, the setlib config uh, config file instead of the module file. The main, the main thing, the main new thing that the CMake Fine Package Multi Generator brought was managing the multi configuration. Okay? The previous one, they were single configuration. If, I don't know if you use both Windows and Linux and CMake, but the way they, they manage the configuration is different. If you are working with Linux and you want to have a build, uh, a debug, and a release builds, those are basically different projects. Those are, you have to do two uh, project generations to CMake generate a step and then to uh, CMake build the steps in two different folders if you d don't want to uh, have them overwrite each other. And then for other, other setups like Visual Studio uh, and the Visual Studio generators in CMake, it is a multi-configuration multi generator. It means that you only need to generate once, you generate one project for Visual Studio, and then you can build both in debug and release from the same project. If you go to the ID, there is a box there that you can select without having to generate a, a new CMake project or whatever. That means that uh, for single configurations, we have to pass the minus D CMake build type, release or debug, at generate time. And in Visual Studio, we don't have to, do, to pass that ever. We define it at build time. So this was the contribution of CMake Find Package Multi. The generator started to create both release and debug uh, variants. And you could use them from your ID, as we have seen in the, in, the previous, in the previous slide. You might be asking why you need two Conan installs. Again, the only way that you can really scale is if you manage configuration one by one. Because release and debug are not the only configurations. You have the rel with the uh, info. You have, you want, there are many projects in the enterprise that they are called, I guess that you have them, release DLL. Who has a release DLL configuration somewhere? Yeah, it's, it, it's not that, that unusual. So there are custom configurations. The only way to manage them, you cannot just package all the different binaries in one package. You need to have one package and then one Conan install per configuration. And then you can aggregate them, and with the CMake Find Package Multi, we manage to have a Visual Studio that you can switch in the IDE directly from the backend release, and it would, it would work. <coughs> Still, this had some, some problem. It was still too intrusive. I simplify a little bit the slides because I, when I was talking about CMake find package generators, I have forgot, I have dropped the toolchain part. There is still a setup about the compiler, compiler version and uh, C++ standard that I've, I've hidden uh, here. That part is still necessary. 
That means that in the, in the previous, in the past, you needed both generators. You need the CMake to define at least the toolchain part, and then you could use any of the CMake fan package or CMake fan package multi to get the dependencies information. But uh, honestly, this was, this was too messy. Users were confused, they didn't know how to choose, and the whole, the whole approach was still a bit intrusive because you needed to at least include the Conan Bilinfo that she make uh, for, the, for the build list. And there was a, an extra problem here that is the model for dependencies in Conan 1 and with these legacy generators is, was overlinking. They didn't have a model of the, of, the different, of the different libraries that they were involved in the, in the process. That means that no matter when we have a dependency graph like this, it didn't matter what, were the, what was the, the type of the libraries. If it was a shared library or a static library, in this case, the application was always linking with both engine and math. And that can generate overlinking. That can generate bloated binaries, you, depending on the, on the library types, we will see it later in the solution. You don't want that, okay? These generators, they couldn't manage, they couldn't manage this scenario. They were always linking everything, and that, that was also a, a problem. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, were, we were getting the feedback, hey, we want more transparent integration. We want to execute Conan install, and then our CMake should be pure should be absolutely agnostic about Conan. And at the same time, there were a bunch of users that they, especially uh, enterprise users, say, oh, okay, no, I need my developers to not change absolutely anything. That means when they are typing CMake to create their projects, I want CMake to call Conan install to install the dependencies. Okay? And this is what we call the CMake Conan integration. It's calling Conan from the execution of CMake. So moving from the canonical, let's say canonical flow that is calling Conan install and then calling CMake, they want to have a single command that was CMake and that should do everything internally. So the approach to do this uh, was something like that. We had to do like a step back and the only, the only way to achieve that, I'm talking about back in, in 2019, something like that, was this, is adding things to your CMake list. It's the only way, okay? And what, what were those things. In your CMake list, you have to, to handle, you need to get the functionality to do this. In this case, you could, for example, download the, the Conan CMake file from, from a place. Then you needed to include this file. Then we were using the functionality inside this file, for example, to create the Conan file.txt or Conan file.py on the fly based on something that is defined in the CMake list. Then we would be deducing the Conan profile settings from the CMake configuration. If the CMake compiler was this, then we translated that from, uh, to a Conan profile. And finally, we were calling Conan install to install the dependencies. All of that, and that's very simple. If something changes, something, you would get your CMake list growing and growing just to be able to call Conan install from your CMake exec execution. At the end of the day, we managed. It was possible with, uh, with that uh, CMake Conan integration. There were developers, they could call in Conan CMake and they would get their dependencies installed. And this worked. Problem, of course, is this was extremely, extremely intrusive. You have to have like a big chunk of your CMake list uh, polluted with Conan things, and that was uh, less than ideal. And besides that, there were too much boilerplate. Consider that we have just there a macro. We are calling a function just to generate a text file. And for me, this is absolutely overkill. It's just another layer of, of integration functionality to write a, a text file. For me, this is, this, is really, this is absolutely unnecessary. Furthermore, if you put this in your CMake list, and then you create a package for this, at some point you will be installing this package. If you install this package and, and build that package from source, then you are calling Conan to install that package. That package will be calling CMake to build itself and CMake, CMake could be calling Conan install again recursively to install the dependencies, which is something that you don't want. So you also needed to protect the code so it didn't re-enter re the, the, the functionality. So this was, of course, less than, than ideal. Then this is the present situation. This is what I've been uh, showing in the demo before. Uh, we moved those generators, CMake and CMake Fine Package and CMake Fine Package Multi, 
two, two clear generators, which the responsibility is very, very decoupled. The CMEC toolchain, to generate a modern CMEC toolchain with the definition of the compiler and our toolchain, and the CMEC depths that is creating the, the, the files necessary to find my dependencies. And with, with these two files, we, is the way that we achieve a fully transparent integration with, with CMEC without needing to modify any of our, our CMEC lists at all. Let's have a quick look at, at, the, at the CMEC devs generator. It's looking something like this. So, of course, it got both all the good things from the previous generators. It, it got them. Uh, it is a multi-configuration generator, so it will, be, it will be installing in release and debug and read with the info as many configurations that you have. It can manage them in parallel. It will be generating a bunch of files, so things are kind of the couple, it's easy to, to debug. So it will be generating a file just with the data, with the variables for your dependencies. So if something is wrong, you can check that file and see if you got the, the folders in the right place and if your packages are correctly defined. It's a way to, to easily debug. Then it follows the typical uh, config, CMake config structure. You know, if you have created config files yourself or if you have used them, you will see this config file, the config version file, and you will see also the targets, which is the, where the actual targets are created. So we are mimicking that, and we are, have a, C, a setlib targets that is the one creating the targets. The, in this case, the setlib, setlib uppercase target will be created. And then we will have one file per configuration. And every one of these files it would be the one adding the specific information from that configuration. In this case, the include directories for release uh, will be added, library directories for release with generator expressions, they will be, they will be added that way. Um, we generalize, uh, so we realize besides the information of the target names that we had in the past, we realize that there is a bunch of information that we might need in the consumers for CMake. So uh, basically, there are packages changing the file name different to the target name. So there are libraries out there that they have a, the package name is one, the file that generates a, is a file name is different, and the target names are different. There are packages there that they want to generate, still they want to generate all legacy module files or they want to create alias. So there are a bunch of configurations there that now are possible to define how do you want your consumers to customize the CMake files that are, are generated. And finally, with these new generators and Conan to Zero, we managed to solve the problem of overlinking. How, the, how we, did we manage it? We introduced a thing that is called the, the dependency or requirement traits. The requirement traits is similar, it's an extension of the private and public uh, linkage requirements in CMake. Okay, it's basically the same concept, but a bit, a bit uh, generalized. In this case, when we have an application linking a static library that is linking another static library, we know that the application should be linking with both libraries. Okay, so the trait, the trait that says, hey, you should be linking with the libraries, is propagating down the graph uh, till the app. And by default, and this is something that was very requested by the enterprise, by default, we should be hiding the headers. So uh, Engine is using the math library, but we don't want the math headers to be visible to the application. Because if we make them visible, that means that the game developers, they will accidentally include the, the math library, then Engine do, does a refactor, remove the math library, and then everything starts to, to fail. So if you have a transitive dependency by default, by software engineering rules, it should be as hidden as possible. Of course, unless engine public headers are including uh, math headers. But you have the full control. So, so the trace can define what gets propagated that the graph, both for headers and libraries. So then for a, st for a static library, the default is you need to propagate the libraries, linkage requirements. And by default, you don't want to propagate the headers visibility. So if you can hide them, and math can be an implementation detail of engine, you want to hide those header propagation. And now this is, this is successfully done. And for other cases, for example, with, when, when engine is a shared library, and it is linking a static library, it's linking math as a static library, this is what happens. Actually, in the binary for engine DLL, we have the math functions copied inside. That means that when we are linking the application with the, with the engine, we really don't need to link with math, because everything is an implementation detail of engine. 
And this is what the traits uh, manage. In this case, the game, the game is linked with engine, and the traits say, hey, no, you don't need the headers of math because they were hidden, and you also don't need to link with the, with the math uh, static library because it has already been embedded in the, in the engine. Again, very similar to the private and public concept of CMake, but generalized to any build system. Recall that the, the cool thing is here is you can have a graph there, and every different package can be built with different build systems. So it's not that everything is CMake, and you can define private, public, CMake targets for everything. So every different package out there can be a different build system. OK, that was the CMake devs for managing the dependencies. And now the CMake toolchain. The CMake toolchain created also uh, toolchains in CMake, it started also to get more traction, it started to be, be more popularized, and be recommended as a way to define your compiler settings. So nowadays, no one should be hard coding the CMake list, something like the CPPSTV, or the libcxx, or anything, anything related to a specific compiler version, or a specific operating system, things like that, shouldn't be hard coded anymore in CMake list. They should be part of a CMake toolchain that you can pass in the command line. And this is what we did. We created, we have, we have the CMake toolchain generator to create a Conan toolchain CMake file that is looking something like this. OK, this is the file created by the generator. First, very important, we always allow users to do what they want. So if a user, they want to inject, they want to define their own toolchain files, they can do it and it will be included in the Conan toolchain .cmake file, so it will be adding their functionality. Then we will be defining things like platform and toolset. We will define the runtime, C++ standard, flags, and also how to locate the other files that CMake Depths is generating for us. Why, why the toolchain is so important? Because we have a dependency graph. We, when we are now working, we shouldn't be thinking just about our application that we are building at this moment. If we are building my application in this case, and I want to create a package, or I just want to build a binary, I will be defining my configuration. Hey, I'm using Visual Studio, this version, C++ 17, whatever. OK, so, okay yeah, I will generate a Conan toolchain for my current application to build with these settings. But we have to consider now that we have dependencies. Let's say, let's say that this application depends on OpenCV. Okay? And let's assume that OpenCV, I don't have a pre-compiled binary for my configuration. So OpenCV needs to be built from source in this case. How do I guarantee that the, that the binary for OpenCV is binary compatible with my application? It needs to be built with the same toolchain, basically with the same compiler settings, the same flags, uh, it's the only way. So when I'm building OpenCV, I need to be able to pass to OpenCV, hey, you need to create yourself with this toolchain. Okay? So now I hope that you start to say, why, why CMake list, why recipes? And there is a very good talk about, uh, by Robert Smacker about packaging things. Why CMake list shouldn't be hard coding, things like that. The, the configuration should be a parameter. It should be a toolchain that can be passed uh, to them. So you can command, hey, I want to create a binary for this configuration, passing a toolchain or passing another different toolchain, and you will, you will be a different one. Recall again that this is not only CMake. Okay? We, sometimes we need to build uh, uh, things in our dependency graph, build with other build systems. How do we achieve that? Okay, every build system, they have different mechanisms to inject the toolchain. So if we are talking about OpenSSL, for example, that is built with something kind of auto, not really auto tools, but close to auto tools. Um, so it understands some auto tools. So we can use the auto tools toolchain, and we can define compiler flags that will set the architecture, the, the build type release uh, optimizer flags, C++ 17. We can define all of those things. And that, well, C++ 17 for our OpenSSL is irrelevant, of course. Uh, but it will, it will guarantee that the OpenSSL binary that we create as a dependency is compatible with our, with our current build. I, again, the, one of the major contributions of the, of the CMake toolchain, of the modern CMake toolchain generator, is that you can customize many, many things. If you need to inject uh, anything like from the system name, system version, system processor for cross-building, you can, you can inject your own toolchain. You can override the full toolchain if you want. You can inject uh, compiler flags uh, at will. 
So it has a, a lot of um, configuration. How, how to use a toolchain? If you haven't used a toolchain before, uh, a toolchain is just a command line argument for, for CMake. So you call, uh, in this case, Conan install. It will install the dependencies. It will create the Conan toolchain.cmake file. And then you can pass to CMake a uh, CMake. CMake toolchain find this file. And if you are in a single configuration, you will pass CMake build type. If you are not in a single conf configuration, you will not pass the CMake build type. And then this will create your project. And it will, it will work. OK, still, I need to type like a relatively long CMake command, which is CMake with the tool chain, et cetera. But the, uh, the great thing that uh, CMake, CMake 3.19 uh, brought is the CMake presets. Honestly, I think that we need something like CMake 3.24 to have uh, presets that are, are usable. Um, but this is, a, this is a great feature. Basically, a CMake preset file is a, is a JSON file that goes in the root of our project. It has to be uh, collocated with, this, with the root CMake list of our project. It cannot be in a subfolder. It has to be there. Okay? It can be a CMake user presence if you want to. Okay? But basically, it's a, it's a JSON file that looks like that. Looks like all the possible, all the possible um, command line arguments that you could be passing manually to CMake they are contained there in the JSON file. So instead of passing like a long, a long command line to CMake, you just pass one argument, which is the preset file that you, you want to apply. And the other good thing about CMake presets is that it can contain many different configurations. You can put the commands for debug, commands for release, and you can create your own custom configuration, which is basically sets of command line arguments to CMake. And that's super, super convenient. So what we did is, OK, we already have the CMake toolchain generator. It's creating the toolchain file already. Let's have the CMake toolchain generator also create a CMake user presets and a CMake presets file. That was relatively straightforward. We are already talking about Conan 147, and it was released like last year. So this is pretty, pretty modern. So what we did is create a JSON file on the fly, uh, the presets file. This file contains here, you can see, it will inject the Conan toolchain automatically. It will define the generators. And that's, that's basically it. That's, that's how it works. So let's do also another uh, quick demo. So this is basically the same demo as before, but uh, without using the CMake, the CMake Conan integration. That means that the first thing that I should be using is calling Conan install. Explicitly, it will install my dependencies. And one of the good things that we, we see here when we are using uh, Conan is that it can fail fast. For example, in this case, it's telling me, hey, there is a dependency there, TensorFlow Lite, for example, that it really needs C17 to work. And I didn't. I, I use my default is C14. And I, when I typed Conan install, it was using my default which was C++ 14. So now, OK, it told me, OK, no problem. I will use C++ 17 to build my application. And then I did Conan install. This generated for me a CMake user presets. I didn't have the CMake user presets before. Okay? The CMake toolchain integration generated for me the presets file, and now I can use the preset file as I did before. In this case, um, it generates Conan something default to differentiate from your own. Uh, if you have your own presets, uh, so having the Conan name there is to, to, get, to make evident that you are using a file, a, a, a target that is defined by, by Conan. And then we can build it. Again, Conan release. And if everything works, I should be able to get the compile the same application as I did before. Ah, yeah, this will be working. OK, so this uh, is much, much better than we have in the past. Still, there are some problems in those integrations that we are aware of. 
Um, this problem is uh, CMEC depths uh, still generate some targets that are a bit artificial. We generate too many interface, interface targets that can be a bit, a bit messy when you are using them. There are some gaps, especially for Windows shared libraries. Uh, we might be missing, in some cases, the imported location information in the target's properties. It's not evident to get that. We have a, a Conan feature that is called deployers. So if you want to copy all your DLLs, for example, from your dependencies, it's very simple. You just use a Conan deployer, and it will copy all the DLLs to the place that you want. But if you want to do it with CMake, you, you might struggle a, a little bit. And believe it or not, but one of the issues that we have recently had is the pushback from happy 2015 uh, Conan users. And they were saying, no, 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 no. We, we don't like the transparent integration. We don't like the targets. We don't like fine package. The whole, the whole CMake integration was great. We loved that we could do the include, Coconut and Belim for the CMake. And we love the Conan lips there, because in that way, we didn't have to touch CMake at all. We could just add a new dependency. We added a new dependency in our Conan file, and then everything worked. And our application started to link with a new library transparently, with having, having to touch a CMake list at all. So now I hope that you understand better sometimes the, the tension that the open source maintainers we are we are submitted because, yeah, we got like a, a huge push to move to a transparent integration, but now we have some users, and those are typically big enterprise users that you want them happy, that are pushing, are pulling in the completely opposite direction, completely opposite direction. And I believe it's a very bad place to be, to be there. Be kind with your open source maintainers, please. Um, okay, and finally, something super exciting is. Um, the CMake Conan integration for Conan to zero. Because we, the, this need was still there. Users, there were still users that they wanted in Conan 2, they wanted the developers to just be calling CMake and not having to call Conan install before. Good news CMake 324 uh, introduces dependency providers. Dependency providers is nothing uh, but a way to define an interceptors for certain uh, CMake uh, calls. In this case, the most typical one is the find package. So you can define something in, your, in a file, in a CMake file, that you can inject. Okay? And you say, hey, whenever someone calls find package, instead of calling the CMake find package, please call this other method here. And I will manage to have the functionality there. And then this file, let's call it setup.cmake, but it can be called any way you, you, you like. This file can be defined, again, in the command line. As CMake project top level includes, you can define this file, and this file will automatically inject the interceptor for find package. That means that, means that in this way is how we can achieve a fully transparent integration for, uh, for calling CMake. The first demo that I did today, calling CMake with a preset, was doing exactly this. It was using the Conan provider to inject the interceptor, and when it found the find package, it was calling Conan installed at that moment. So a simplified implementation of the, the CMake Conan dependency provider is like this. First, we don't want to be calling Conan installed for every find package. A typical project will contain uh, multiple find package, one per, per dependency. Okay? We don't want to call Conan installed for every one of them. One Conan install is good enough to install all the dependencies. So we have some variables there that basically protect, and they will allow only Conan, Conan install once. Uh, we check that Conan is, itself is installing the system. Otherwise, the error for the developers is confusing. So we'll be telling them, hey, you don't have Conan in your system. We still need to call Conan install. Please install Conan. We will be mapping the CMA configuration to Conan, because we have learned that is very important to be able to pass the, the profile information, the configuration information, to dependencies, that they might be in a different build system. So in this case, when we are calling CMake, the driver is not Conan anymore. The driver is CMake, and CMake will have their own configuration. So this, this method here, this Conan profile detect default and uh, detect host profiles, they are basically getting all the information from CMake, and it, it's translating that information to a Conan profile. Because that Conan profile, we can pass it to the dependencies, and then we will guarantee that our dependencies 
binaries are matching our current CMake build. But we are inverting the control. When we call Conan install, the driver is Conan, and it will be defining their profiles. When we are calling CMake with this integration, the driver is CMake. And we have to extract the information from CMake and then convert that to a Conan profile to be injected into the dependencies. And finally, we will be calling a Conan install with those arguments. And finally, this is very important, we have, called Conan, we have intercepted, we have inhibited the, the fine package call. We have called Conan install to install the dependencies. But we still need to forward to the, to the CMake fine package. So it works, and it finds the actual package, and it defines the targets, and everything. So this, using the bypass provider argument to find package, is the way that we can call the find package without uh, entering infinitely recursively in our own in our own interceptor. OK, so I wanted to summarize here the two different flows. First, we have the flow that is defined, is driven by Conan. It's just in Conan install first. This would be very similar to uh, other languages. You go, I don't know, to, to JavaScript, and then type in something like npm install to install the dependencies, and then type in gulp or whatever to build the project is something that is typical. This would be like the canonical proposed Conan flow which is, hey, you call Conan install, it will be installing things, it will be generating files, and then you can call CMake, and you can either pass a toolchain file if you want to, or if you are using modern CMake, you can also define, you can pass the preset, the preset generated preset file that is also convenient. And this is the other approach. If we don't want our developers to touch uh, or have to call Conan install manually, we can invert the control and we can use the, the CMake Conan integra integration with a dependency provider. And again, we can pass the provider as a command line argument like this, or we can put that command into a CMake preset, and then we can just pass the preset to the, to the CMake um, command. OK. Good. So this was about the, the present. And uh, as I've told you, there are still some problems that we, we need to figure out. We want to improve both our CMake toolchain. We want to add environment information to the CMake toolchain, something that today we are generating uh, script files, like bat files or cell, cell files, cell script files. Okay. We want to be able to CMake toolchain to also generate environment information. We want to improve CMake depths. We want to refactor. We want to simplify. So there are still this is uh, something that is, is ongoing. But today, I wanted to talk about something more exciting. It's the common package specification. Okay, this is something that we are actively working on. And this is going, was going to be, the, hopefully, the future for dependency management in C++. So we are talking here, uh, a CPS file is basically a file that defines uh, a package, defines the content of a compiled binary. Okay, so it doesn't matter uh, how this binary was created. If a dependency manager brought it to your system, you installed it manually, it was already in your system, it doesn't matter. It's a file that represents your compiled binary and that can be used by any build system to use that package. Okay? Um, in theory, in the simplest form that I'm proposing today, I'm talking today, the, you really don't need the version. You don't need the ABI. We are assuming that this binary is already binary compatible with your, with your current build. Okay, we are just focusing on how the information from the package needs to be passed to the build system, the consumer build system, so this package can be, can be successfully used. So I'm not the first one about talking about the, the CPS. There has been a lot of uh, previous work there, but the good thing is that things are starting to get traction now, like now in the previous CPPCon. There were existing solutions for this problem, previous attempts. We have, of, of course, uh, package config, PC files, there, they have problems, mainly that they are only defining uh, variables, like global, global compile flags. And this is a bad approach. It's difficult to manage. We have CMake leaks. We have the config CMake leaks. It's basically an attempt to solve this problem. But the problem is that it's specific to CMake. It only works for CMake. And of course, the, the generated files, they are not usable by other systems. You cannot parse a CMake, a CMake list or a, a config CMake file and understand what is there. This is, this is uh, definitely not, not something that we want to do. And of course, the package info method of Conan is another approach to, to tackle this problem, to have an, a, a common representation of a package so it can be used by any build system. 
the goal of the CPS is exactly this, is we want every build system, when they are building a, something, besides the artifacts, besides the library, they should be creating a CPS file. And then this CPS file can be consumed by any other build system. This is the goal of the CPS proposal. This is to achieve the interoperability that Conan has been uh, proposing for, for years. This is what is happening with the, with the CPS proposal. So what is the CPS? CPS is something that is as, can be as simple as that. It's a JSON representation. In this case, if we are talking about setlib, it would be something like this. It's, hey, where are the headers? Where are the libraries? And what's the library name? That's basically all you need to know uh, to uh, successfully use your, your setlib uh, package in your own application. Of course, this is a specific for, this is specific for, um, uh, for a specific way. So then we could be, we could be uh, discussing many details about this. Hey, the include this, it seems very, very simple, right? Why is it a list? Why it is not, uh, by default, we assume that it is uh, empty? And empty means, or, or not defined, it means that it is included by default. Okay, so there are tons of discussions there. Why are they relative, relative paths? They are relative because by default we want this. We want to be able to have a package and we want to be able to, be, to move that package to elsewhere. And we should be able to use that package from the moved location without any issues. Should we force in the, in the CPS specification, should we force that path should be relative always? Probably not. Because there are other packages that they might be installing the system in a, in a path that is it cannot be made relative because they are installed in different places. And typical example, Windows. If you, you put things in a different unit, you cannot make a relative path between different units in Windows. That's a limitation. So in some occasions, you might need an absolute path there. So these are the things that we are discussing in this, in this CPS uh, proposal. Oh, Setlib was simple. OpenSSL. OpenSSL actually contains two libraries. What does OpenSSL, when you're linking OpenSSL, what does it mean? Are you linking both of them? Are you linking only one? What if you only want to link one of them but not the other? How do you manage that? We need a way to represent that problem in the CPS. And we call it components. So a CPS should also be able to model what is inside a package. And a package is, can be more than one library. There is no way that we are splitting OpenSSL in one package per library. OpenSSL maintainers won't do this. So we have to leave that one package should be able to have more than one library at the same time. And some users will want to link with both, and some users will only want to link with one of them. And there should be a way to represent that. And there should be a way to represent the relationships between different components of the same package, and also relationships between the, um, the components of one package and components and libraries of other packages. In this case, OpenSSL, the crypto component of OpenSSL depends on setlib. And this is something that we need also to represent in, in this OpenSSL uh, CPS file. Other things that we are considering, you, this also works not only for your own, when you have a package. When you're also developing your projects, you can have a CPS file that is pointing to something at development time. So you don't need to be repackaging all the time to be able to use a dependency. And you can work simultaneously on several dependencies on your dependency graph. And the CPS file should be able to connect each other, like kind of a meta project that is connecting several subprojects, even if they are built with different build systems. And the most exciting part of this, and this is ongoing work, this is getting traction. This was one of the keynotes in CPPCon, was by CMake and Bloomberg. And this load package function there is a prototype that they have. Okay? So they have a prototype already that is calling load package, and they can explicitly pass a CPS file. And instead of calling find package, they will be getting the information from a CPS file. Okay? We are also collaborating with them uh, towards another demo that the CPS file are actually generated by Conan. So this is also uh, a thing. In Conan itself, we already have all the information in our package info. So for us, the CPS is basically dumping, dump, dumping one JSON file from the information that we ha have already there. So we are very, very close to have lots of information, CPS files, for many different packages. I also did a talk in, in CPPCon, so it's not available yet online, 
But if you are interested about that, I, I recommend having a look when it's online. And to finalize, this will be the, the call. This is actively happening today. In the CPP Lang Slack, there is an ecosystem, uh, ecosystem evolution, I think, Slack channel that you can join, okay, and you will get there the, what, is, what is happening. There is a repo there that we will be using as a main point of uh, contact and discussions and issues for this proposal. There is a mailing list. Uh, in the mailing list, if you subscribe and everything, you will get uh, calls for monthly meetings. We are doing monthly meetings uh, via Zoom, and we are discussing things over, over there. Okay, so to finish uh, my conclusions, the CMEC and core integration is something that is live and evolving, okay? And always very important, based on user feedback. We cannot do anything without the users, so it's very important. Uh, CMEC and core in 2023 can provide a fully transparent integration. We have seen in the demo, called just CMEC presets, and you got the, your dependencies installed. Um, and it works in all uh, build systems and operating systems. Uh, using this is very important. This is my, my, my key take. Using a package manager in 2023 is not perfect. I will not lie to you. If you use Conan, you will, find, you will find issues. If you use other package manager, you will find issues, for sure. It will, not per it will not be no perfect. It will not adapt perfectly to your needs. Okay? Still, it's much better than not doing it. Okay? And still, the only way that we can all move forward together to something better in dependency management is if you start dropping A, I know I'm building libraries manually from source in my CI directly, and you start engage with any, I don't care, Conan or other, but engage any of them, contribute back to them, and, and, and move the ecosystem uh, forward uh, together. And finally, the future is looking even better. I think with the CPS proposal, it will be a game changer uh, we, our aim is to have much better dependency management for C++ in maybe in two years' time or something like that, and I think it will be possible. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions. <laughs> any questions? Uh, maybe you, you need to go to the microphone so uh, everyone, and also the recording, uh, gets it. Uh, hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, at the company I work for, uh, we're very interested in being able to reproduce or like rebuild uh, all our programs in like 30 years in the future. Um, and when I see like in the CMake uh, uh, lists text on like find package CLib, I get like very worried. I'm like, oh, this is going to be like the latest uh, <laughs> CLib that we're downloading. So I mean, we are using Artifactory because like a public repository would be very unreliable. But still, I would be very interested in knowing like how would I use Conan or can I use Conan to make sure that I can still remake. Uh, uh, rebuild the same uh, programs in 30 years uh, and have the exact same. Yes, absolutely. We we, we have uh, we have users, especially there are some sectors like medical sector, for example, health sector, uh, that they are very concerned about this. They have they, they need to be able to reproduce exactly the same build with the same hardware in 20 years. So they even keep physical machines and DVDs and things like that in a storage, so they can reproduce everything from hardware to the. And the way to achieve this is, okay, you have to decouple things. So because you have the CMake list here, and you have a fine package, not even version information, okay? Then this is where a dependency manager or, or package manager uh, enters. When we define the Conan file.py, the first thing that we can put there is we can put a version number, okay? That version number guarantees that you are getting that version. But even inside that version, you can get what we call a revision. A revision is something like that, it's a hash. It's a hash that is the hash of the contents. It's equivalent to a git commit um, for, um, for a dependency. That it guarantees that you get exactly the same thing, you get exactly the same dependency uh, now and 10 years from now. The idea is that these two dependencies, they have many transitive dependencies. So you cannot put the, the, the exact revision, the exact git uh, there, because you will need to put like a bunch of them and all of them. So, Conan, in this case, it implements what we call, it's a very common mechanism in other package managers, it's called log files. So when you do a Conan install, basically, um, 
uh, I can I think I can show you this is block file out. Uh, let's see if it works. And then let's see what I, I'm putting. No, sorry. This is. So I'm basically generating a log file that is like this. It will contain in every dependency with its SESAC revision. Okay? So if I use this log file 10 years from now, I will get exactly the same dependency graph that I've, I've used today. Okay, good, thank you. One more quick question. Um, why did you name it Conan? <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good question, a very, very old one. So like eight years ago when we were looking for a name, we were looking for something that was powerful, something that started with a C, hopefully something that was uh, not a, an existing command. So if you try to use something like package or something like that, in, there will be a weird Linux distro that is already using that, that name, or there will be another so then when we realized, uh, someone was joking and said, hey, what about Conan? I said, what, are you crazy? Something like that. And then we realized, and the domain, Conan.io, was available. And finding a domain that was available back then was super difficult. So when we said Conan.io is available, OK, this is a signal. Let's go for it. I don't care if the name is crazy. Uh, let's go for it. And then it catch up, and we have the Conan the Frogarian and all that stuff. So it happened to be a good name. Thank you. OK. we have. Time for one question from the internet. Um, insightful di uh, talk, Diego. Do you recommend any Conan best practices trainer facing some pain points at presence at my work with Conan and other dev ecosystems, CMake, Lang, tool, tooling, etc., for various use cases? We use Conan 1.59 and CMake 3.24. I see training in JFrog are market as deprecated now. Uh, so good practices about Conan and learning Conan. It's true that right now we, ha we are in the transition from Conan 1 to Conan 2. Conan 2 was released in February, okay? uh, but Conan is, is very popular in the enterprise. And migrating from one major version to another major version can take years. Okay? Uh, it's true that we have deprecated the trainings in the JFrog Academy because they were teaching the very legacy generators like CMake. And this is considered nowadays, they are considered bad practices. They are not even following CMake by, by, uh, best practices. So even if you need to attach to Conan 1, the best practices would be use only the modern generators, use only CMake devs and CMake toolchain. Uh, of course, try to use presets if possible. That's very, that's very convenient. Uh, and besides that, is uh, one of the things, this is a very common question, is good practices. The users want silver bullets. Uh, there is no such in C++. We have, something that we have learned is that every company, they have different needs. The projects are widely different. The different constraints, different requirements, different policies, whatever. So it's very, very challenging to recommend something. There will be companies that require strict log files for, uh, from ten, 10 years from now. They are completely, they don't care. They prefer to be uh, as quickly as they don't care if their builds break and they will be just fixing things and, and move forward. So there are no like general good practices. I would say best practice is reach out. Uh, go to our GitHub repo, file a ticket, ask questions. We will be there to help. Even if you, if you need some help, uh, we can do Zoom calls or whatever to, to talk to you. And then for every specific use case, we will try to say, hey, maybe you want to use a log file. Or maybe you don't need it. Maybe you, you can just pin your versions in your in your. Or you, if you want to go fast, then you can maybe the recommended practice would be using a. Maybe you want to use something like a version range, something like this, because this way, whenever a TensorFlow light version uh, comes up, you don't need to modify your Conan file anymore. The, you you get a new release, and then you this this will be automatically picking the picking the, the last version. So depending on, on what is the problem that you are trying to solve with a dependency and package manager, the solutions might be different. So my best practice recommendation is read the docs and reach out to us, and we will love to, to help you. Okay, thank you very much.